And let me briefly introduce Bruce Gray as the executive director of the Northwest Primary Care uh, Association. And Anthony Chen is the director and health officer for the uh, Tacoma Pierce County Health Department. I'm going to keep the introductions pretty brief because if Dr. Shaw is able to join us, and Dr. Shaw is the Secretary of Health for Washington State, uh, he would only be able to join us for about the first half hour anyways. So I'm going to dive right into a series of, of questions after I give you the very briefest of introductions here to what our topic is today. Uh, as we are considering how healthcare will be reformed in the future, it behooves us to consider all the other aspects of health besides the medical community. And indeed, I suspect many of you who are on this call, this Zoom today, appreciate that the major contributors to health are not in fact medical care. Uh, the major contributors are things like poverty, education, employment, where one lives. Those are the social determinants of health. Uh, beyond that, it's the larger things that affect entire communities. For example, the work that public health organ uh, organizations take on every day, assuring that our food supply is safe, the air we breathe is clean, the water we drink is safe, uh, and uh, that the spread of diseases is monitored and the opportunities to prevent disease are optimized. Well, and here we have Dr. Shaw. Thank you so much, too. Mayor. Can you hear me? And uh, Anthony yeah. and Umair, if you can unmute yourselves. I can. Can you hear me, Gary? I can. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, so I've given introductions briefly about Dr. Chen and uh, Bruce Gray. And uh, Dr. Shaw is, as I said, the uh, Secretary of Health for Washington State. He has a, a long career in both uh, medical practice as well as the director of one of the very largest, is it the third largest uh, health public health agency in the United States at, at, in Houston. So he has a, a long history also in public health. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, as I said, this is a conversation about the role of public health as we consider how the healthcare system should be reformed into the future. And, and I thought I would start off, th this is the soft question for all of you. Why should public health be considered as part of healthcare reform? And I'll try and alternate who gets to go first on each of these so that you each have a chance to hear what the others are saying. Um, uh, Anthony, could you start us off? Why should public health be considered as part of healthcare reform? Well, I think first of all, if you start off and you look at um, the large gains in longevity in the US and health status, the vast majority of the health improvements have come from public health interventions, right? Sanitation, control, communicable diseases. Um, that's just where it starts. Um, another thing to remember is that in general, most people spend no more than 5% of their lives in the healthcare system and 95% in the community. And that historically has kind of been the, you know, the area that public health works in. Um, and lastly, public health is very systems oriented, which sets it up well to um, be able to address um, the, the many different factors that produce health. Dr. Shaw, would you want to add to that? Yeah, first of all, Gary, thanks for having me. Sorry, I was on the long link. So I apologize for joining a little bit late here. It's great to join Dr. Chen and, and Bruce and others uh, on this uh, panel. I, I would say, uh, similar to what Dr. Chen said, the only thing I would add is that we have to remember that when we say healthcare, uh, we are oftentimes talking about disease care or, or repair care, repair shop. Uh, you know, when you get sick, you get injured, you go into the quote unquote healthcare system. But really, if we're tra talking truly about health, it is very much about prevention. It's about keeping people well. It's a whole host of things. And so you cannot talk about healthcare reform without talking about true health. And that's where public health and prevention come in. 
Thank you for that perspective. For a different perspective, for someone who is working in that healthcare delivery system, Bruce, what's your feeling? Because you um, certainly have been part of a challenging system. The uh, funding for primary care has always tailed at the end of the funding for the rest of the medical care system. Um, but at the same time, that primary care system has always been much more closely aligned with the public health interests of the community. So how do you, why do you think public health should be considered part of this healthcare reform initiative? Absolutely, and Gary, I wanna thank you as well for, for inviting me to join. Um, and just to echo, I think you touched on it in the very first comment you made in introducing this around the social determinants is those false dichotomies between public health, primary care, tertiary care, I think we're recognizing that really the need to break down some of those, those, those boundaries and find ways to interconnect, to integrate across public health, across primary care. So really from my point of view, when I think about the social determinants, and this is very much in the DNA of the community health center movement. I head up the association, uh, the regional association of the community health centers. And our founding in 1960 was very much about the health of the community not just medical care for individuals in the community. So it's very much a kind of a back to the future for us is that we really see the opportunity to partner with public health, with tertiary care in a way that, that, that breaks down the boundaries and allows us to truly address the social determinants. And I think there's a quote that I, I love using at times. It says, the future's already here. It's just not evenly distributed. And we already have wonderful innovations and examples of where public health and primary care are working together in such a, a new way, in such a new and, and innovative way that I think it's partly identifying those and figuring out how we scale. Thank you all. What a, a great opening for this conversation. Uh, so uh, two uh, reminders to the, those who are on this call. Dr. Shaw is going to have to leave us early and that's why I'm moving us quickly through these questions, giving him a chance to participate as much as he can. I'll also ask audience members, if you have questions, please post them in the chat. We're going to monitor that and hopefully get to questions and answers later on. So my next question, a follow-up to that, if we believe that public health should be a part of the healthcare reform movement, what needs to be changed to improve public health as the healthcare system is reformed? Dr. Shaw, would you like to take that one first? Sure, you know, Gary. I think I think w w the 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 three of us have just talked about the importance of the interconnections with healthcare, primary care, if you will, um, as well as what's happening in the public health prevention side. It is a continuum. It is absolutely connected. There is no way to to demarcate uh, because it it is really interwoven. When you have an individual, a patient, uh, when you know when we've all seen patients in our, I, I've done it through either primary care or emergency care. You know, I'll be honest, at the end of the day, uh, what happens uh, to that patient, that individual, isn't just about the four walls of that clinic or that emergency department or that hospital. It's really what happens in the community. So if I say, Mrs. Jones, go, you know, you, you need to you need to shed a few pounds and let's let's get into into a healthier lifestyle. And she says, well, I'd love to, but the park next to me is is dilapidated or it's got dangerous dogs or I'm worried about my kids with, you know, with with guns or what have you uh, that they're not safe, then that is going to make her less likely to get on to, into that park. So we absolutely need to be thinking about the upstream approaches. But the other piece of this and this pandemic has shown us is the, the interconnectedness of healthcare and medicine, as well as public health. And so, you know, we, we could not have done anything in public health without also uh, uh, part and parcel with our healthcare partners. It had to be this partnership. The, the real challenge we're gonna have is that we do come together during emergencies, not that we did it so well uh, during this pandemic, but the, the question is whether we have the collective will to come together even when you have blue sky and you don't have those emergencies that bring us together and really uh, recognize the importance of our, our need to both incorporate and reform together in both parts of our health system. So I'm hearing you echo an, the earlier comment Bruce made about needing to integrate uh, and uh, Bruce, would you 
Well, from your perspective, you're outside the governmental public health system. And I don't think any of us on this panel would, would dispute that uh, the governmental public health system is the entire thing. We, we wouldn't say that that's what it is. We agree that there are many partners to that process of assuring the community's health, but you're actually working in a different environment. So what do you think needs to be changed um, to improve public health as the healthcare system is reformed. Mm -hmm. Well, Gary, one of the things I'm, I'm aware of is the, um, that original process from the 90s around the 10 essential public health services and kind of the core of that. And, and what I've seen recently is in, in kind of revising that and looking that, at that from the De Beaumont Foundation and some other partners, a recognition of, of what I've heard the term centering equity and that equity as a key component, how we're looking at, at disparities in a community as impacting the entire community. We cannot just address medical care for those coming into the four walls and expect our, the health of our communities to improve unless we're truly thinking of the health more broadly around, again, that notion of centering equity and how we're all being treated and being benefited by, you know, not only the medical care um, and the primary and tertiary care, but very much how are we making sure that, you know, to, to Dr. Shah's point, we are truly looking at the collective, the will, the collective will of our, our, of our society and, and our, our communities to truly take on those more difficult systemic issues and, and historical issues uh, that we look at. We need to look at environmental health and, and, and climate change. We need to look at, at structural racism. There's a whole series of issues that we really have to be uh, proactive around that, that are, I think, part of primary care and part of public health. And actually you're working on those front lines. Um, all of the panelists are, are doing this, but from your perspective, are, are there, can you give me an example, give the audience an example of where the primary care system and the public health system, notably the governmental public health system are already coming together to address the inequities, for example, that you are uh, citing? Well, one um, going back to a, at a federal level, I'm, what I'm very excited about is this effort over the last several years by it's 25 more federal agencies have come together under what they've released just within the last month is that plan for an equitable um, long-term recovery and resilience for social, behavioral, and community health. It's, it's a long title but it's an effort by the, the federal agencies to really look at how we, we begin to look more at the vital conditions. We look at thriving communities and, and that broader piece. So I, from that point of view, to me, again, that involves the, the Department of Health, US Department of Health, Department of Labor, a whole series of federal agencies coming together, really in the first time I would see as ever is really shifting to more that vital, addressing the vital conditions and what's thriving in a community and not just the deficits within a community. So to my point of view, that's one area that's very exciting here in the region, as you know, since you're involved in it, is we also have an exciting partnership between the primary care, the regional primary care world and the Northwest Center for Public Health Practice at the University of Washington, in terms of bringing folks together from the two worlds to really understand each other's cultures, to understand each other's lingos. lingos. I think it's, it's really that relational piece. How can we build the relationships across these, these different sectors so that we, we can start to break down those, those artificial barriers. Yeah, great, thank you. And, and Anthony, I, I wanted to take it a, a step further because you've been actively involved over the past decade in the effort to identify the essential services of public health, the foundations of public health, and to try and cost out those services and then bring that forward because uh, an important part of this process to improve public health certainly includes funding. From your perspective, if the healthcare system is ref being reformed, what do you see is needed for public health to change in that process? Well, I think there are two areas. There's kind of the areas internal to public health and then the areas where there's the interface between public health and the healthcare system. So internal to public health, I think, Gary, you're referring to the foundational public health services work, which 
I can address later when you get to advocacy issues. But um, I think there's still a lot of infrastructure in public health that needs to be built up. I think you know King County, Pierce County, Snohomish, the larger counties have more infrastructure, although not complete infrastructures, but certainly when you get out to small counties like Garfield, Asotin, they have very little infrastructure. So we need to build out uh, the infrastructure in public health and refill the pipeline. The pipeline has been severely depleted um, over the years, right? In 2008, in the recession, there were some health departments that were cut by 50%. I have colleagues in smaller um, health departments who have to go out and inspect wells and septics because they, they just have a handful of employees. So that's part of their job. Um, but then we, at that time, and pre-COVID, we're already looking at an aging workforce. Post-COVID, people have been burned out, you know, and just like in healthcare, right? People have been burned out, they've been threatened, people have left. So we need to do that. Um, within public health, I think for many of the healthcare systems, because they're kind of more on a survival basis, we need to build out their ability to work on uh, policy systems, environmental change. So in public health, we call that public health 3.0, uh, you know, really helping lead the strategy for health in their communities. Um, but it takes a very different mindset than what we used to do in terms of ensuring clean water, inspecting restaurants, so on and so forth. Um, but also as part of that, I'm, you know, I, I'm glad to hear Bruce talk about like partnerships with, with uh, University of Washington, Northwest Center for Public Health Practice. There are a lot of theoretical frameworks in public health that can be used to apply to tackle some of the very prickly problems. So I think the one that's quoted often is like the Haddon Matrix, which was used to uh, really tackle the issue about um, car uh, motor vehicle injuries. Um, and that has significantly um, led to decrease in fatalities for motor vehicle accidents. That framework has been applied to um, gun violence, firearm injuries, uh, prevention. So making sure that public health practitioners are familiar with these more academic frameworks so that they can apply it to other things, right? So applying head and matrix to, to violence, for example. Um, there's also this movement in violence about addressing violence as a communicable disease, right? So again, places like King County, Pierce County, we've got lots of people, we've got smart people, we can think about that. Smaller health departments don't have those resources. Now, moving over to healthcare system, I think the really big holy grail for us, or as I see it for public health, you know, one of the fundamental, you know, core functions of public health is assessment. We have lots of good public health databases. We do not have healthcare databases. Healthcare systems have their EPICs, their CERNERS, their electronic health records. We do not have access to them. We don't know how many people are feeling depressed. However, healthcare systems, because of the pay for performance contracts, are counting how many PHQ-9s are being done. They have a different measure about depression than we do. I mean, we, we have to rely on the behavioral health risk factor surveillance system. So one of the things that would be really helpful would be to start to link um, healthcare system information systems with public health um, data uh, information systems. And I think also what would be really critical is payers and stakeholders should demand that there be a focus on at least two things. One is, as Bruce said, on equity, right? Uh, when we talk about health for all and healthcare for all, we have to be addressing disparities and inequities. And so stakeholders need to demand that the, the healthcare systems are addressing those, not just counting how many procedures they're doing or how, many, how much fancy equipment they're buying. It has to be, how are you tackling disparities and equities to ensure that health is for all? The second thing is that they should insist on true population health. Every healthcare system CEO talks about population health. What they talk about is the health of their patient panel who they're making money off of and who their con their value-based payment contracts are, they need to start talk, um, be held accountable for the true population health. So for me, my population health is 900,000 people in Pierce County. Well, Multicare, Virginia Mason, Franciscan Health, Kaiser, all the other healthcare systems in Pierce County should be held accountable for the health of 900,000 people in Pierce County, not just the fraction that 
come and pay them, right? Because when we get to that level, there will be greater collaboration between the systems. There, you know, that public health will be happy to help them with that. Um, but there, that's not going to happen until payers and stakeholders demand that. Dr. Shaw, I want to give you a chance to also add to that or comment on what you're seeing are the needed changes. Uh, both Bruce and Anthony gave us a lot to think about. They certainly did. You know, I think the big key uh, that we haven't really talked about is investment. Uh, you know, ultimately, when we talk about collective will, political will, uh, we talk about policy, we talk about all the need for, and I think all of us can come to some agreement. We may not agree on every specific aspect, but we will <clears throat> absolutely agree that, yes, medicine and public health need to work better together. They need to be markedly more integrated. We need to learn from our past and also build a future that is, you see in the back of my uh, my my uh, <clears throat> uh, backdrop is our, we just recently released our transformational plan. And really um, the way I've been uh, couching this is that we can be transactional in the way we approach this 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 point in time, this inflection point with COVID-19, or we can be transformational and the choice is ours. But all that requires investment. And you know, we have to be advocating for each other. So, you know, it's 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 rare that you have to have doctors and nurses and and you know ambulances with the sirens or bells, whistles, hospitals with H's or crosses that you have to go and say, let's advocate for because we don't have enough funding there. Um, although it's not it's not perfect, absolutely there we need to to be markedly more effective and efficient in the way we we fund and resource many of those uh, healthcare entities. But it's a far cry to say um, three to four to five percent of dollars in health that are spent in the U.S. are spent in public health, and that is really a challenge that we've got because we've got the vast majority of dollars that are going in another kind of way of looking at the world and not necessarily in the public health and prevention side. So I do think it's it, it's really important that we touch on investment. And Bruce and, and Dr. Chen will be the first to say that it, and we've already talked about it, Gary, about this real concept of social determinants of health. So then if you get into trying to bring together all those other social elements that go into housing and transportation, education, and jobs and empowerment and things of that nature. Now you have a whole host of other reasons that we have to also invest in not just public health and not just healthcare, but both together, because it's also not just the health investment, it's the investment in social services, social activities, which this nation frankly has lagged on over the, over the honestly decades. And when you compare us with OECD countries and you start to do a global look at where we are as a nation, we fall quite short. And that is another piece of health reform that needs to be accounted for. So investment in health, but also investment in social that comes together ultimately in a way that's going to really allow us to do absolutely what collective will, political will, and policy making that we need to do. Because if we don't do that, then really we're talking, we're not actually going about trying to, to put our money where our mouth is. Well, that's a terrific segue, and because I know you're going to have to leave the panel early, I'm going to ask you to take that next question, which is, uh, since you brought it up, you said, you know, we've got to fund it, we've got to look to some structural changes, the ability for these various government entities to also collaborate with one another, it, that's an issue that's been raised. So how should the advocacy for changes to public health and the healthcare delivery system be managed as health care is reformed. I mean, what steps are actually needed now in your mind to reshape this health, health system, not a healthcare delivery or not a public health, this health system of the future? What steps need to be taken? Well, I think, Gary, first of all, universal health, I mean, there's a, there's a real coverage issue that, you know, we, we, we know that if you have health insurance, that doesn't necessarily make you, quote unquote, healthier. But we also recognize that when you are not worried about the, the premiums or the ability to actually pay for your health services, that does make it harder for people to really, truly 
uh, take care of their health. And so I think there is that aspect that that we need to acknowledge up front. The other is this real, you know, where we've gotten as a nation is this fee for service and this move that really is necessary to be more value based and that that real opportunity for us to be thinking about what is it that you're getting the 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 buck what is the what is the investment you're getting the dollar that that is the ROI on what you have invested in and so when you look at value based care you are you are having to show value for the expenditures or the interactions in that in that healthcare setting i think that is another key piece of this uh, certainly we want to look at flexible and braided funding and making sure that we have flexibility that goes well beyond the healthcare piece and 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 gets into that community piece and this is where CMS really comes in and if I could just for a moment Gary just get into the segue which is really important is is this concept of if if we can get to a point where healthcare providers are required to ask those questions and intersect their work with what's happening on the social side of the house or what's happening in the community side of the house. And you have those flags in the healthcare system very much that in order to get compensated, to get reimbursed, you actually have to make sure you're asking about homelessness and you're asking about education, you're asking about all sorts of social supports. That really starts to make it clear to a healthcare provider that it matters Matters. We're going to pay what matters, and we're also going to ask you to make sure you're asking the questions about social determinants and community health, and not just what's happening within, again, the four walls of your clinic or your primary care interaction or your emergency department or hospital intersection. That is so key to what we're trying to do. And so when we look at our transformational plan, and again, I hope you have a chance that we can drop it in the chat, the link to the transformational plan. I hope you have an opportunity to think about the, the wide array of the way we're looking at not just the individual, but the family, the family, not just the family, but the neighborhood, not just the neighborhood, but the community, not just the community, but all of us together. Because ultimately, we've got to have some specific things that are happening within the healthcare system, but we also have to have an investment in the non-healthcare community health side, because ultimately, it's not an either or, it's an and. And Gary, I've, I, I bought myself an extra five, seven minutes, so I'm going to stick around for just a few minutes longer, and then I will have to drop. But thank you, Gary. Okay. Thank you, Amir. Bruce, what do you think are the steps needed to happen now for us to move to a, an integrated health system, something that really delivers the value that Dr. Shaw is mentioning? Well, I'd love to tie together when uh, Dr. Shaw talked about not just transactional, but truly transformational. And when Dr. Chen laid out the data piece, we need to be investing in the data systems to be able to, to track across public health primary care. We need to be looking at true population health, not just the, the patient, you know, population of a patient base, but, but more broadly that. And I'd add in also workforce. We have to think not only about the, 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 the level of, of exhaustion our, our healthcare workforce is experiencing right now, but how do we think transformationally in that area? And I think really team-based care, and for us in primary care, very much looking to Dr. Shaw's points about how do we get outside the four walls around community health workers, around teams that can take the care there. When we think about our society and the level of convenience we now have with technologies, with apps, where you could do a Lyft or an Uber, wherever you are, we need to find ways to meet people where they are in their homes. We need to find ways to, to create convenience. And I do think that's, that's combining that element of public health and primary care around um, getting outside the four walls and truly addressing that notion of, of, their, of the part. I, I do wanna share one thing I'm very excited about that ties in with Dr. Shaw's point is a, a project in Massachusetts as a result of their 1115 Medicaid waiver where with their, the Massachusetts Flexible Services Program, they've invested $150 million in, in setting up a, a, an opportunity for the ACOs. And in this case, there's a particular ACO that's a health center, community health center based one, that is um, using the funds to do referrals around housing instability, around food insecurity. And through that, they've found already, it's about two, three years in, they've found that there's a 91% a success rate in referrals. And I had a chance to talk with the director of that at a national meeting in Florida several weeks ago. And she shared the fact, and this is the thing that popped out of me, is the community health workers that are part of this program have gotten so excited because they're finally feeling that patients who are coming to them 
feel like they can successfully get referred out to services to support what they need more broadly around the social determinants. Consequently, you've got that 91% success rate. And, and they've also looked at, at reduced ER visits. They've looked at, at decrease in terms of improved diabetes and certainly around housing instability and food insecurity. They've got the data to show that when you bring, when you do the braided funding, as both Dr. Chen and Dr. Shaw mentioned, and you really look at this opportunity to create programs that, that you know, from a structural point of view, in this case, Medicaid, are really bringing together the social determinants with the medical care piece. It's, it's dynamite, it's absolutely exciting. It's, it really is the transformation, transformational piece that we need. And I think that you just mentioned something that one of the audience members was asking me to ask the panel, given that provider, healthcare providers have limited time in the clinical setting to spend with their, their patients, their clients, and given that if we ask about uh, homelessness, what do they do when they get the answer? Yeah, I am homeless. And where are those resources? And you've just given a, a terrific example. If you build the capacity for the system to provide those resources, it doesn't have to be on the clinician's shoulders, exactly. but it does have to be built structurally into the system. And that's, I think, what I'm hearing all of you saying about that. Yeah. Hey, Anthony, <laughs> what, what do you think about the changes that are going to be necessary to move us into this reformed system? There, well, there are a lot of things. I mentioned earlier that the, our state legislature is working on the foundational public health um, services funding, and that's a kind of a long-term investment. So we need uh, continued advocacy for the state to move forward on that plan and move on to the next chunk of funding, the next legislative session. I think COVID-19 really tore the scab off the problems that we had. I mean, the huge racial ethnic disparities that we saw, uh, but, you know, also, I mean, who, who were at the high, who was the highest risk for death as people with chronic diseases, right? And, and now that COVID is quieting down, wh what's popping back up? Mental health, um, substance abuse, right. alcohol use, car crashes, they're all getting, they all got worse, right? So it's, you know, when public health departments don't have the resources and capacity to deal with those um, kind of inter-sectoral um, problems, then we're never going to solve it. Um, you know, you heard me mention um, earlier access to healthcare data systems, um, and I totally agree with Bruce and Umer about the screening for social needs. Um, but I think there are ways, again, going back to this policy systems environmental change approach that we need to take, we need to build into the system for them to collect other data. Most healthcare system data um, systems are set up for billing. So many of them don't even collect racial ethnic data. How can you look at racial ethnic disparities if you don't know the race and ethnicity of your clients? However, if you want to look at um, social needs, boy, you need to be documenting income, educational level, where they live, cross-mapping that to the equity index um, in your community, right? So if you can, those of you who are participating in healthcare systems, influence your system so they collect that data. And once they have the data, you can do stuff with the data. You don't have the data, you can't. You can talk about it, but it's harder to do it. Um, I think it's really important to require and demand public health participation in these processes. You heard me talk about building clinical and community linkages. Bruce, I heard you mention community health workers. That's one great example, community uh, clinical community linkages. Um, and, and then again, arguing within your healthcare systems and within the greater healthcare environment that we need to move from tertiary to primary and secondary prevention, and even better, we need to move to wellness, right? And that is where, again, these overlapping Venn diagrams, right, in general healthcare is working on individuals and treatment, public health is working on populations and prevention, but there's so much overlap. Think about anything that clinicians do, right? I mean, someone needs to quit smoking. It's often the primary care providers uh, picking that up. They maybe write a prescription, counsel them, advise them, but public health is there making sure that there are smoking cessation groups, making sure that the state is paying for nicotine patches and meds for this, right? So we really have to be able to work across that. And one really important thing, which the WSMA has gotten absolutely 
right. You cannot change this unless physicians and healthcare providers move into leadership positions in your healthcare systems. As long as MBAs are running healthcare systems, what is the outcome in a capitalist society? Money. What is the outcome? What should be the outcome in healthcare systems is health. And in public health, that is the outcome we look at, health. So until you get a change in leadership of people who can actually say, by the way, what's this thing about no margin, no mission? It can't be all margin, no mission. It's got to be mission and margin, right? And healthcare providers and physicians and nurses and psychologists, social workers, all those people need to be in leadership positions to move the healthcare systems in the right direction. Dr. Shah, I know you're about to leave. Do you want to give any final comments to the audience about the how public health plays a, this role in the transformation of the healthcare system? Yeah, I, I really, uh, first of all, I want to thank you, Gary, for, for having me and apologies to everybody uh, that I have to leave a little bit early. I had a prior commitment. Um, uh, I want to uh, echo what Bruce and um, and Anthony just uh, have mentioned in their answers, and particularly in in Dr. Chen's last comment about this real, you know, where 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 we need to make sure that we are looking to integrate that leadership piece, which is so key. I would add one other piece to that because I think it's so critical, which is lived experience. And you know, we have so many people that have gone through so much. We oftentimes don't have those voices that are at the table. And so we've got to really be thinking about when it's about reform, when it's about how do we integrate, when it's about what are those decisions we're trying to make. We have to not just be us having those conversations, but we, and all of us are consumers of health. So don't get me wrong. It's not that we have not, uh, we do not have uh, insight into how the system works, but there are particular communities and, and, and persons in our communities who absolutely need to be at the table because oftentimes their voices are not anywhere that are part of this discussion or set of discussions. So we've got to make sure we've got that as part of this as well. And I think that gets to the this real uh, concept of engagement, true engagement, and also the the, the notion of equity, the Bruce's comment about um, really centering equity in the middle of all this, that is so key to this. And then I would just add in our innovation work, there is so much around not just doing the same thing over and over again, but really thinking outside of the box and really making sure that innovation is part of this. So as I close, Gary, I would just say thank you very much for having me uh, to be a part of this discussion. I really want to just thank this 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 group of this convening of all of us, because ultimately we've got to be thinking about the collective and political will, but also how do we want to bring these two entities together and then invest appropriately. We cannot do this work when we are not investing enough on one side of the equation or on the other side of the equation, we're over-investing. And even if we're over-investing, we have to make sure that we're appropriately investing and making sure that those dollars are effective and efficient and value, value, value and patient and population and health outcomes are such a key way of being able to determine the success of that investment. And so ultimately raising that visibility, making sure that we show value and when you have the value that you have validation with pro-health policies, pro-health resources, or both, that's the way we are going to get out of this pickle that we are in. And then remembering that COVID-19 brought us together during an emergency, but we've got to have blue sky days where we're continuing to work on these issues. So thank you again and really appreciate the time. And I hope everybody stays it's actually sunny in, in, in Western Washington. I'm shocking. Uh, there's no snow on the ground, at least where I am. So I hope you will all stay, um, stay safe and, and protected, but also recognizing that it is going to get a little bit colder as we get a little bit further into the winter. So, so please stay warm. Thanks, Sumer. Take care now. Take care. Okay, so... Um, for Dr. Chen and for Bruce Gray, uh, I'm going to transition into a question and answer opportunity. We've had a number of questions presented in the chat box and I'm going to remind our audience, if you have a question, please post it in the chat. We'll try and get to all of the questions 
that are posted here. So for the two of you, Bruce, why don't you take this first one? What about teaching public health and the social determinants of health in our school, starting as early as elementary school? Mm -hmm. um, what do you think about making that a part of the curriculum so that we move beyond the the reading, writing, arithmetic kind of thing, and we move into how do we build a society that is equitable, for instance, and what really would be the role of both public health and the primary care system in either advocating for those things or playing a direct role in providing that kind of education? Yeah, Gary, what I love about that question is it really gets to the heart of the cultural change we need to make. And, and in the sense that, and to Dr. Chen's points, and, and Dr. Chen, I so appreciate how you've laid out much of this from a systems point of view. How do you look at all, how all these elements tie together? So when you think about how we, we tr how we, the education we provide at a young age, how we look at, at health. Um, I have twins uh, who are ninth graders right now in high school who are taking a health education class. And I think about how beneficial that would be to be even earlier, to have opportunities to really understand not only individual health, but what are some of the partners in your community around health, like public health, like primary care? So I think that's an absolutely terrific idea. I would also say in our medical schools, in our, our, our clinician programs, in our training programs, we need to have a much better um, sharing of what the, 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 the world of providing care will be when they come out of. We, one of the programs we run is the, a campus of an osteopathic medical school out of Portland. And what I've found terrific about some of the the students who have gone through that over the years is the ones who are also looking to pursue an MPH and who are, are really trying to understand from a systems point of view, not only how they might provide care as a, as a physician, but how they might think of changing the system to really bring together those different elements. So that whole notion of, of education, going back into our, our you know, grade school, I would also translate that out into, are we thinking across all of the, you know, in high school and college, in our in our clinician trainings, medical school or, or elsewhere, where do we really bring in the elements to better understand what are what, what do we what leads to true health outcomes? Not just and I like what Dr. Chen said, it's not just about medical care. Really thinking about health, wellness, and well-being. And for us, all three of those are very coded, in the sense of moving from a medical care element to more preventive care, and then truly with the well-being that gets at those vital con conditions. And of the seven key vital conditions around the thriving framework, the, the core middle one is around the sense of belonging and civic, um, civic engagement. And, and I really think that's where that starts is we really have to go back to the civic issues behind this. And I just have to let you know, you are prescient in that the question that followed up to the what I just presented to you had to do specifically with training for physicians and other healthcare providers. So you already touched on it, making it clear to me, there is really no separation here. It is a continuum. There isn't. It's about starting the educational process early and continuing it through our lives. And of course, I'll remind everyone on the calls, on, on the, in the meeting, there's a good reason why we call it medical practice because we're never done learning. So Absolutely. I think you've made the point We've, we've got to interject, inject that kind of training into every level of education. Hey, Anthony, how about you? What, what do you think about the, this business uh, about trying to get people educated about public health and primary care and prevention from a very early age and then all the way through the educational process? You, you know, you, you have to understand that not um, awareness and knowledge doesn't change behavior, right? So like how many smokers on the street corner can tell you smoking's bad for them? We've done a really good job educating them. So while you need to build it in there, you, it's really important for you to build it in a way that people are doing it. In fact, when you talk about um, the social, economic, environmental conditions that produce health, schools are some of the best practitioners of this, right? Schools, um, well, certainly in this part of the country, maybe not in other parts of the country, schools are like the last remaining social institution, right? The Granges aren't the social institutions, right? The churches in this area are not the major uh, social institutions. Schools are. They're dealing with homelessness, hunger, mental health, child abuse, 
adverse childhood experiences and they are do making interventions in it. So I think what Bruce said is really key is that while the schools are doing it, there is less awareness and it's really not built into the culture of the parents and the schools and the communities. In, in a lot of our school interventions, we'd like to think about it as it's, you know, while it might sound like we're intervening with the kids in the school, we can't do that without engaging their parents and the community around the school. And what I mean by a community around the school is that there are a lot of people invested in schools who don't have kids in school. And that's where you get the, the big social change is when you get the parents and the communities engaged in it. And of course, long term, you're setting up these kids to understand and practice this. So I remember when I was in medical school at Duke, which is a very specialized uh, medical school, however, does produce a lot of primary care physicians for the state of North Carolina. In my um, basic family medicine rotation, they made us do a home visit. At the time, it's like, oh, this is kind of cute. This is kind of like what Marcus Welby used to do. However, I continued to do that when I was in practice, right? Until 14 years ago when I was in practice, I was still doing home visits. And when you do a home visit, you can see things that no one will tell you. Nowadays, at least with Zoom, we might be able to see into someone's home, but in general, you can't look in the refrigerator, you can't look at the mess, whatever, right? But doing home visits, you get to understand environments. So, if, so what I'm getting at is rather than coming at them in the face and saying, this is what public health is, this is these are the social economic environmental conditions that produce health, you have them do projects, you have them work as part of the curriculum in instruction strategies where they have to work in the community, they have to work with their um, fellow students, learn about the adverse childhood experiences that their fellow students have gone through, how this is impacting their ability to study and show up every day, or not show up every day. <laughs> Right, you've got to just build this in as part of how you do the education, not to come at them and say this is the public health, right? right? But then also think about some of the other things about systems thinking. You cannot expect people to be adults and think in a systems way if they were never trained to think in a systems way. So it needs to be built into the social studies curriculum, history curriculum, everything else. You just need to demonstrate how systems thinking is so important to analyze things, right? Um, so anyway, so that's I, that's a very public health approach, which is you kind of just embed it into the system. Um, that's the only way you're going to impact large um, populations, which really schools are, you know, large populations. And, um, you know, hopefully that over time then will start, no one will start questioning it in the future. They'll, everyone should be able to analyze data, right? Um, like this stuff we saw in COVID where people couldn't understand data and they're making up their own data. If we had trained people in math, critical thinking, understanding data, hopefully we could have created greater buffer in our community. However, our educational system has failed in doing a lot of that, right? So of course it's easy to sell someone that, you know, these you know, horse pills can actually cure COVID or whatever. I, I have to say, I'm reminded when I was in clinical practice, I made home visits as well. And uh, in fact, when I was in training, I remember making a home visit with a an internist whose heart was in the right place. We visited a, a person who was pretty much blind and who was living in a real disarray in, in the household. But when he was removed from that household against his will, he died three months later. And to this day, I will always believe that the decision was made to move this person from an environment that he understood and that which worked for him, but to a different environment that was simply imposed. And so I think that gets to this notion, as you said, Anthony, it's not just knowledge, it's also the experience. And if people are playing an active role in not just their own health, but the community's health, then we change the culture. And that's going to be getting at what Bruce is talking about, this civic engagement and that kind of change. There are a couple of other questions, but let me just ask uh, Ronnie Shur how we're doing on time, and if you want to uh, take over, if you or if I have time for a couple of more questions to my panel. 
Yes, you have eight more minutes. How about eight more minutes? So squeeze in a couple more questions would be great. Okay, let me do that. There's a question raised about the mental health care system. And as, as you are aware, there uh, have been some recent innovations in that system. The, the, que the question posted here is about the 988 system. And, and so how do public health and the healthcare delivery system need to collaborate to really make a difference in the mental health of our communities? So uh, Anthony, do you wanna start with that? And then Bruce? Yeah, this is something which I, you know, it's very near and dear to me. I mean, it's something I've spent a lot of time in. Um, I think, I can't remember, Bruce Umer earlier made some comment about housing and referral. Hey, you know, if you make a referral for housing and there are no houses, tough, right? And 988 will only work um, on two levels. One is there may be some brief interventions that they can do. And the other is that if there are resources for to send people to, right? So, and too much focus, I think, has been on the severe chronically mentally ill. We need to, again, move up to, you know, away from tertiary prevention to primary, secondary, and wellness. And so what does that mean? That, that means there are all these other things we need to address, adverse childhood experiences, poverty, homelessness, all those things. But also, um, you know, we do a program called Triple P, which is Positive Parenting Program, and it uses, I think, a very um, nice model, but it's a similar model that we use for other things, you know, like even in healthcare, how you've got primary, secondary, tertiary healthcare systems. So like in Triple P, it starts with a base of um, kind of public information, mass media campaigns, um, level two Triple P trains. Um, people who are non-healthcare prof professionals to do brief assessments and interventions. Okay, so these might be the secretaries in a school. It might be the librarian. It might, you know, someone who, when they see a, a child interaction with a parent, that they can do something to kind of intervene, help get them towards care. Level three, like here in Pierce County, we have trained um, some primary care providers to do that in a higher level. And level four is where they refer them to our family support centers, right? We need to maximize, it, it's not just mental health. I mean, yesterday I was just speaking to the, our core dental foundation, same thing. They have been training primary care docs to look in kids' mouth, apply varnish and, and sealants, well, not sealants, I'm sorry, varnish, and make referrals, right? You have now gone from a very limited supply of dentists to a huge pool of primary care docs who are capable of doing that. We're not expecting to do fillings, right? So, but just like in that triple P level, we don't expect um, primary care docs to be doing psychotherapy on, you know, with kids and parents, but they can do brief interventions. So we need to expand that. Think innovatively. Um, Bruce mentioned community health workers. Community health workers can be extensions of the healthcare systems, right? So there are just so many ways that we can just fill out the need and we can um, one of the things that we've been working with our healthcare systems on is trying to implement SBIRT, so screening, brief intervention, referral for treatment. And you know, the the small group that we're working with, they wanted, I was really impressed. They wanted to do smoking, drug use, alcohol use, and depression. That's a lot. But you know, anyone who's in primary care knows there's a lot of people with those problems, right? And, and the key skill we're teaching those people is motivational interviewing. Okay, but that's what we need to do first. Get just who, I mean, I, in social services, talk about no wrong door. Doesn't matter if it's the librarian, doesn't matter if it's a primary care doc, someone should be able to recognize the issue, make a brief intervention, get them to the care they need. Bruce? I, I, I was going to say, I love the connection of things like motivational interviewing is an incredible skill and, and understanding, as Dr. Chen said, that when you talk about ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, how that ties in with his point around if you're trying to educate folks around smoking is a, a, a bad thing for you, it doesn't matter if the experiences, the physiology has, has been impacted at a point where we, we need to understand the, the, the full range, the full impact. Um, so I, I know, Gary, we're up on time, and I just want to say how much I appreciate this conversation. And really, as, as Dr. Shaw said, the work that all of you on this Zoom are doing in this area, because this is the bridging. You know, the bridging of, of, of worlds, a bridging of sectors that has to continue. 
Well, I want to thank our panel. Uh, Dr. Shaw is not here, but I'll, let me remind the audience that there is posted in the chat a link to the Department of Health's transformational plan. Uh, I want to thank uh, Bruce Gray, a friend, colleague, and uh, the executive director of the Northwest Regional Primary Care Association, and Dr. Anthony Chen, also a friend, a running partner, and uh, the health officer and director of the Tacoma Pierce County uh, Dep Health Department. So with that, um, my apologies to anyone who may have put a question into the chat and I, we didn't get to it, but I think it's been a lively and very informative discussion and I'm turning it back now over to Ronnie Shore.